I was born in Newport News, Virginia, November the 29th, 1920, at the old Buxton Hospital on the Boulevard. I don't even know if it's still there. And I grew up on 32nd Street. Our address was 82 32nd Street. We were right, the foot of our street was where the James River came right up to the foot of the street. I grew up there with my two brothers, my older brother Marx and my younger brother Arthur Jr., my parents, and two bachelor uncles. Uh, next door to us there was an apartment building that quite a few people we knew lived there. Uh, Rena and Charlie Cates lived there once, Bessie and Mar Schwartz and their children, Eugene Schwartz and Bernice Schwartz, who became Bernice Ellenson, and Rabbi Finkel. And then the house next to them was occupied by Mrs. Ida Nackman, who owned the Nackman's department store, and her children. Uh, her children were Rena, who became Rena Cates, and Edith, who became Edith Ligham, and two sons, Harry and, goodness, what's the other one? Can't think of it, that's my short-term memory at this age. Harry and, anyway. So we were all very close, and in those days, very often in the summer, everybody came to our front porch after dinner to just sit and talk and enjoy the breeze that we had from the river. And of course, that location, as kids, we walked up 32nd Street, crossed West Avenue, another block and crossed Washington Avenue. Then there was the John W. Daniel Elementary School that we attended. Next to that was the Road of Sholem Temple, where we worshiped and went to Sunday school. And then we crossed Huntington Avenue where Newport News High School was. So from my house at 82 32nd Street, we just walked up 32nd Street and everything was right there. Not like today, everything's so spread out. And uh, I, we had a, I had a group of friends, girls. We were, we were about five or six of us, I can give you the names, and we had a group called the Just Jolly Juniors, and our sort of den mother was Bernice Slavin Gordon. She was married to Leonard Gordon. And the, the girls were in it. It was myself, uh, Miriam Morwitz, Rhea Mermelstein, Carlin Gordon, and Francis Morwitz. And we just had this group of friends, and we're st those of us who are still left are still in touch with one another. And uh, I graduated from New News High School in 1936. Well, I graduated in 19, oh, before that, some of the fun things we did in those days, we didn't have video games, we played hopscotch, and. The boys shot marbles, a mom and mumly peg, and uh, we skated on roller skates. And my father had a truck, and in the summertime, he used to pile all of us, the boys and girls, a whole group from Sunday school, and we would go to Buck Row Beach in the evening, and we would swim and have hot dogs and marshmallows we roasted. We just had that kind of good times. We didn't have all the technological entertainment that's available today. Anyway, I graduated high school in 1936, and I went to Mary Washington College in Fredericksburg, and graduated from there in 1940. And of course, you know, those four years were wonderful years. Made good friends and learned a lot. And when I graduated, 
I went to work for a very short time at a bank, the Citizen Marine Jefferson, I think it was called. Then after that, I took a civil service exam, exam and went to work for the Army. This was, of course, a year before Pearl Harbor in 1941, so when that happened, I was already working for the Army. And through those war years of World War II, in addition to working as a civilian in the Army, I and another group, which I'll tell you about, were in the Canteen Corps of the Red Cross and I have a picture of that, which I can show you. And we would go down to the port of embarkation where the troop ships left to go to the European theater of war. And um, we would serve donuts and coffee to the, to the troops who were leaving. And it was a very poignant time because we knew that some of those guys wouldn't be coming back. And uh, we would get a call at home, maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night, saying, be down on the docks at midnight or 1 a.m. They always left it during the middle of the night. And we would get up and put on our uniforms and go down and do what, do what we could do to, to help the boys who were leaving to go to fight. Oh, after the war was over, the particular department that I worked for in the Army, the Coast Artillery School, after 1945, at the end of the war, this, the Coast Artillery School was moved, moved from Fort Monroe, Virginia. That's where I worked. I forgot to say that. When I was working during the war, it was at Fort Monroe, Virginia. Anyway, in, at the end of the war, they moved the Coast Artillery School to Fort Winfield Scott in the Presidio in San Francisco. And they wanted me to go with my job and move out with them. Which, what was I at the tender age then? 23 or 4. Uh, and my mother, God bless her, said, well, go if you don't like it, you can come back. So I went. And I, the trip out was wonderful. We drove my car cross country. A soldier and his wife did the driving, and my friend Felice Slavin, whose picture is in the group of the Canteen Corps with the Red Cross. We took about two, three weeks to drive out, and there were no super highways and uh, I 95s and all that. So we just went, and if we liked the place, we stayed for a while. So we ended up in San Francisco, which I adore. That's always since been my favorite city, such a and it was wonderful then. And uh, as I said, I learned so much living in a big city, as opposed to having grown up in Newport News, which I loved. I think I was very lucky to have grown up in that town with the, the Jewish community there. May I go back and say something, oh, sure, something sure. about something that I didn't that. mention? During the war years in Newport News, the Jewish community was very involved in doing all that it could for the Jewish servicemen that were located in that area. We had Army, we had Navy, we had Air Force. It was Air Force and the Air Corps in those days. And uh, we just had so much military, and we had USO dances that we, and we all, I know my house, uh, on weekends we would have servicemen come to spend the weekend just to have a taste of, a Jewish boy it would be, and to have a taste of uh, being at home. And many of the Jewish families in Newport News had Mostly, I think they were all officers who lived with them during, that was where they were billeted. Uh, during, they didn't have enough, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Didn't have enough housing for the servicemen, so families were asked to 
have people live in their homes. And both Rena and Charlie Cates had an officer, and Edith and, and Hickey, his real name, Henry Legum, Legum, they called it, uh, had someone live with them. And we, we just had, had uh, just good times trying to do all that we could to uh, make it uh, home-like for the, for, the, uh, for the Jewish, this is for the Jewish Historical Society, right? So I'm, you know, so the Jewish, and growing up in Newport News in that Jewish community there, laid a great groundwork for me in my life, I believe, following in the footsteps of my mother and Joanne and Sue Ann Cates, Joanne Roos now, and Sue Ann Bangle, their parents, and we were, they instilled us with such good values and have been uh, steadfast in my, my own way of life. And I'm very grateful that I grew up in that kind of uh, community. Uh, anyway, we'll go back to uh, San Francisco. I stayed there a couple of years, and uh, I did move back to Newport News and again went to work for the government, the military. I worked for the Air Corps then at Langley Field. And it was during that time that I met my husband, Millard Fleischer, from Baltimore. And we met on a blind date in, on Memorial Day weekend of 1949, and we were married September the 17th, 1949. Not very long, but uh, we weren't in the same town and going back and forth from Bowl and the Newport News got, anyway, we got married in uh, 1949 and I moved to Washington, D.C. where I've been all these years since. And what an exciting, wonderful place to live. Uh, I didn't work for the first several years of our married life together, but one of the first things we did when I moved there was to join Washington Hebrew Congregation. That, of course, is, harks back to my days in Newport News and my association with with our Jewish heritage. We had two sons. Charles was born in 1950, and Milton, whom we called Butch, was born in 1952. We bought a house on, we lived in a couple of apartments, but then in 1953, we bought a house at 6213 30th Street, Northwest Washington, where we lived for 51 years, a uh, wonderful neighborhood. I'm, I'll get to a little bit of that later. But anyway, after the kids were about 10 and 8, I went back to work again. I think if it had been in this generation today, when I moved to Washington, when I got married, I would have immediately gone back to work. But in those days, when a girl got married, you just became a housewife. Very few people went to work, very few girls, women. But anyway, I did go back when the kids were uh, about 10 and 8, and I went to work for, again, the government. I went to work for the Naval Security Station, which was a very hush-hush installation, and I was there again learning a lot and meeting interesting people until, for whatever reason, I stopped for a while. I think 
it had a lot to do with my husband's mother who had a stroke and had to be in a nursing home and we were just taken up too much with that. But then later on I did start working again, part-time work. The first part-time job I had was I went to work for Dorothy Goldberg, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Arthur J. Goldberg, when he was on the Supreme Court. I worked with her at their, in their home. She was writing a book, which well, I will show you. And I was employed to help her with the writing of the book because some of my work in the Army had been in editing. And um, so I was with them, working in their home, and I was made to feel like a member of the family with the, going to the Supreme Court with her and, and meeting such interesting people. And Justice Goldberg had a Seder every year. He had written his own Haggadah. I wish I had a copy, but I've given all that stuff to my kids. It was like a gathering of the United Nations. It was all people from all different countries, religions, and everybody had to do something and say something. It was just a, the most exciting and wonderful Seder I've ever been to, and very fortunate to have been there. And, and my children also remember it as being a highlight in their lives. So I was with, with uh, Justice Goldberg and his wife, and as I said, treated as a member of the family, until the time that Adlai Stevenson died in London. He was our ambassador to the United Nations, and President Johnson was to you know, appoint someone to replace him. And he wanted to put Abe Fortas on the Supreme Court. This is what we think anyway. He persuaded Justice Goldberg to resign from the court, from the Supreme Court, and take the job of ambassador to the United Nations. And then he appointed Abe Fortas to that seat on the Supreme Court that Justice Goldberg had held. So anyway, they left town because the Goldbergs left town. They went to, to uh, New York to live at uh, our, the quarters there at, at the Waldorf Astoria, where I'm sure our, our ambassador to the United Nations still lives. Uh, Justice Goldberg and his wife went to New York. And uh, then where did I go? Oh, oh, that's when I was recommended to Pearl Nesta. And I went to see her. And we hit it off right away. And I was with her for 10 years. And I have to say, they, they were the most exciting, interesting, enlightening, years that anybody could wish for. I traveled with her to Europe two summers, five weeks each time, where we stayed with in some of our embassies and met. I'll go into some of the things that we did. And uh, we went to Euro I went to Europe with her two summers, right? And then I traveled all over the United States with her on different uh, occasions, New York, California. She gave lectures, and I went with her wherever she went. And um, a couple of little anecdotes, if you would, would like, that might interest people. We went to, to London, well, not an anecdote, but I, we went to uh, Wimbledon at Center Court. We went to, uh, well, our ambassador's home, Winfield. Walter Annenberg was our ambassador to the Court of St. James at that time. And they, they made that home so fantastically beautiful. And in um, Paris, we went at the embassy, and, and in Brussels, 
And at that time, Eisenhower's uh, son was the ambassador. And wherever we went, we were just treated like royalty. In Luxembourg, of course, where Mrs. Mester had been our minister or ambassador, if you will, for five years under Eisenhower and before that Truman. And she was so interesting because she was so friendly with Eisenhower, the Republican, and Truman, the Democrat. She, was, she knew everybody and her, her friends and, and people that she entertained and lived her life with included diplomats, business people, film and radio and television people, uh, anything you could mention. It was just uh, in and out of her apartment. I met so many people, I can't even from try to think of all the interesting people that, uh, that she was so friendly with. Ethel Merman, uh, Margaret, Duchess of Argyle, I mean, the difference of kind of people like. And uh, let's see, Luxembourg, of course, is, was the most exciting place. Both, both years we were there. One year was they were celebrating Remembrance Day, which was when they were liberated from, uh, from, the, from Hitler and, and the Nazis and, uh, and Germany. And every year they, they may still have this Remembrance Day. And uh, we stayed at the embassy there. Anyway, we were in this parade and in this automobile and people waving at us, and I'm sitting in this car waving to the people. I, I, all I could think of is how, how did little Sophie from Newport News get to be in this parade in Luxembourg? So there were so many experiences like that, I, it's just hard to remember them all. But one thing when we were in Luxembourg, there is in Luxembourg a, an American military uh, cemetery, which is quite beautiful and, and quite well known, I believe. And that's where General George Patton, who was so famous, the blood and guts general from World War II, is, is buried in that cemetery. He, and General Patton was actually killed in an automobile accident. But anyway, he was buried in that military cemetery in Luxembourg. And when we were in Luxembourg at a dinner one night at the embassy, I happened to be sitting next to General Patton's son, who was also General George Patton IV. And he told us the story that when his mother died, she, of course, had always wanted to be buried with her husband. Well, the military cemetery did not have anybody but military people and only one woman who was the nurse in the military. So she, she was not allowed to be buried there. But they, she was cremated and General Patton, the fourth in his family, knew the caretaker of the cemetery and they went in one night and they took her ashes and put them there with her husband, General George Patton which is not a story that most people are aware of, but I think is kind of interesting and different. Uh, I was with Mrs. Mesta for 10 years, and as I said, the thing that I learned from her, so I learned so many things from her. She was not only interesting, she was interested. And I sort of, kind of trying to be that way myself, that being interested in others is, is uh, the way you learn so much. And, and I have learned a lot. I've been fortunate to be in the situations where I had the opportunity to, to learn the things that I have in my long life for which I'm grateful. Uh, Mrs. Mester broke her hip 
it's interesting, I have to tell you this too, Mrs. Mester was a, was a Christian scientist, and uh, she was, when we were in uh, London back when we were traveling, before she, she did this, had this hip injury, and uh, Walter Annenberg, An Ambassador Annenberg's wife, Lenora, was also a Christian scientist, and she was a reader. And she helped Mrs. Mesta on several occasions when we were in London. Well, anyway, Mrs. Mesta, I'll go back to, I guess it was around 1975, and her brother moved her from Washington, where she had lived for so, so long, back to Oklahoma City. I have to tell you a little bit more about Mrs. Mesta's background. She was the daughter of William Skirvin, who built the Skirvin Hotel in Oklahoma City. And he also was, had oil wells. So he was a very, very wealthy man. And Pearl, Mest, Pearl Skirvin married George Mesta from Pittsburgh who had the steel companies. So she had the combination of her father's money and her husband's money, which was how she became such a, a wealthy person. And of course, you know the, the show Call Me Madam, Irving Berlin, was based on her life. I don't know if you knew that, Soren. Yeah, you knew that. Anyway, uh, so uh, she was always, after, after that show, Call Me Madam, the hostess with the mostess. And if she did entertain constantly, she loved it and she knew how to do it. When I was with her, I was, she, was, she first lived in an apartment, a tremendous apartment in Washington with her sister at 3,900 watts in place, but when her sister died, they had had four apartments on the top floor of this apartment building, and she kept two of the apartments after her sister died, and then she eventually moved uh, to the uh, Wardman Park. And that's where I went with her from the 3,900 watts into the Wardman Park, and they now have the apartment that she lived there, I-740, is called the Pearl Nesta Suite in the, uh, I don't, I, it's not the Wardman Park anymore, it's the, what's the name of it now? We'll find out. Anyway, uh, that apartment that, I, that she lived in and I worked in so much is now a special Pearl Nesta Suite, I-740. And uh, we, when I used to go to work, I didn't know whether I was going to stay there and, and work on paying bills or doing whatever party she was having, planning the menu and the guest list and planning the seating arrangements, which was always fun because it was always done very much according to protocol. And she used to tell me such interesting, funny stories about people when she was seating a table, well, you can't put this one next to that one. And she'd uh, put a couple who was going together, together, but once you were married, you were separated at a table. Just, just little things like that. Anyway, when I'd get to work, as I said, she would say, come on, we're going down to the Capitol to have lunch in the Senate dining room. So off we'd go to the Capitol, and the, all the Capitol police knew her and just loved her, and, and she was treated like royalty when we'd get down there. So as I, I, it was just, uh, I never knew when I got to work what we were going to be doing, sitting there. It was always fun. It was always fun. And we had so many interesting parties, oh my goodness. Uh, Governor Con uh, Connolly from Texas, we had a huge, 
party for him, party for Ethel Merman when uh, um, let me think a minute, the name of the show that Cab Calloway did here with Hello Dolly when it was in town. Uh, the uh, cast that had Cab Calloway and Pearl Bailey, we had all of them, we had parties for them. She had parties for them, which I was lucky enough to help with. And uh, Ethel Merman, Angela Lansbury, so many. Oh, and let me let me go back to. I'm jumping back and forth on our trips to Europe those summers. We did I did so many different things. They're all kind of popping up. Uh, when we went, we went from London to Dublin. I'll show you a book that a lady in Washington whose name was Rose Saul Salas, who was from Irish descent, and you'll see in this book. And we went to, we went there, the main purpose was to go to a ball at a castle. And where we stayed, we stayed in the home of Desmond Guinness in his castle. Now, it was not a bed and board kind of thing. This is where he and his family lived in this castle. And Mrs. Vesta and I were guests and we stayed in that castle. Again, what am I doing here staying in a castle with this help and you come down to breakfast, like in the movies with the, the breakfast on the big uh, sideboard with the different, and when you went, I, I remember being shown to my bedroom and the step stool to climb up to get into the bed and being given the, the thing to warm the, uh, the sheets. It was, it was like stepping back in time. So wasn't I lucky to be able to do things like that? So many that I can't think of right now. Maybe I'll think of and let you know. Anyway, that's jumping back and forth. That was in Dublin, and we went to this ball. It was all very exciting. And a very interesting lady I met on that trip, whose name was Helen Chaplin. And she ran for many, many, many years the Beverly Wilshire Hotel in Beverly Hills. It was, uh, so we, when we went there, we were always given such wonderful treatment. And as I said, I, don't see the man who owned it then was named Hernando Courtright. Names from the past. But everywhere we went in Chicago, oh, this is one of the most exciting things I ever did. I almost forgot. In 1968, the Democratic and Republican conventions, the Republic, you know the way they decide who has the convention first, it's whoever's out of office. I don't know if you know that. You probably did. Anyway, the Republicans were, had the first convention because Johnson was president. Wasn't he president? Yeah. And, yeah, because anyway, we went to the Republican convention in Miami, and we, because Mrs. Mester was so involved in Oklahoma politics earlier in her years, we got seats on the floor, and we were taped. I have a, a on my computer, I have a video of us being interviewed on the floor at the uh, convention. And, and we went to party after party. That was when Nixon and Agnew were nominated. And then we went to the Democratic Convention in Chicago. We went to both conventions. And we stayed, uh, oh, not awful. Anyway, cut that out. <laughs> We went to the Democratic Convention. 
Is that where we were taped? I think maybe that's where we were taped. Anyway, we went to all the, these parties, and, uh, and that, of course, during the uh, Democratic Convention when they had the, uh, the riots and the tear gas, and we, could, uh, we were picked up every night from the hotel. Uh, anyway, being at both of those conventions were so exciting. And at that time, it wasn't cut and dried before the convention even started, who was going to be the nominee. And of course, Republican was Nixon, and Humphrey was the Democratic nominee. And uh, of course, we know who won. But uh, they, they were just very special times to have been able to go to those two events. And we met, you know, the journalists and, you know, the kind of people that are at, at conventions. We just met all of them and met, went to all these fantastic parties and uh, all the attendant hoopla. They were just, just wonderful. That was 1968. I had just gone with her. That was before we even went to Europe. Well, anyway, during all this exciting time that I had with, with working for such interesting people, I still <laughs> made the time to raise our two sons and, and live a very wonderful life with my husband, Millard. I have to tell you about him. He was from Baltimore, and when I met him, he had just, he was working for a company, the Joseph M. Zamoski Company, which was a distributorship of appliances, radio, television, refrigerators, that kind of thing. In those days, it was all done through distributors. Today, it, it goes from the manufacturer right to the retailer. It wasn't done that way in those days. It went to the distributor, and the distributor sold to the retailers. And he was the vice president in charge of the Zenith department. And that, too, afforded us many wonderful trips and experiences and meeting people. And, of course, raising my raising our children during those years was, was a wonderful time, too, and we were very involved. My husband was involved in the advertising club and the variety club, which always had such wonderful events and entertainment. And uh, what part was that? Oh, with Millard. Well, he was with, with the Zamoski Company, and we, as I said, we did so many wonderful, interesting things with, with them and, and took wonderful trips. And, and, our, and I was, of course, involved with Washington Hebrew Congregation events and sisterhood. And, and as I said, that's always been a major part of my life. So whatever I'm doing, I'm still, that's, that's a very important part. And Charles graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School and went to Southampton College in Long Island. And then from there, he went to the Goodman School of Drama at the Chicago Art Institute for his second two years. And then in the meantime, our second son, Milton Butch, graduated from Woodrow Wilson also, and he went to Morris Harvey College in Charleston, West Virginia, for two years. And then he transferred back into Washington and went to American University, uh, where he graduated in 1970. No, no, no. Well, anyway, let's see, 68. Yeah, I think he graduated in 1970. Anyway, and he worked, stayed in Washington and 
and continued a career in graphic design here in this area. Whereas Charles, when he finished at the Goodman School of Drama, he headed to California and Hollywood and went to pursue a career in comedy and acting, and he does artwork. And one of the things that the most, one of the most memorable things that he's known for, I think that's a little redundant, uh, is he was the voice of Roger Rabbit in the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit. That was filmed in London. And while they were filming there, I went over to visit them, and that was another wonderful time over there while they were doing that. And things that I did, we went to the premiere of Who Framed Roger Rabbit in New York in 1988 at Radio City Music Hall. And then I went to London for the premiere of the movie uh, where we met, met Princess Diana. And I have a picture of Charles with Princess Diana, which I'll show you. I'm in the background, but you don't see me. That, of course, was very exciting with Steven Spielberg and uh, Dick Williams, who was the, did the animation, he, he was, I, I don't know what his title would have been, did the drawing, the animating. Uh, that was a very exciting time, and of course it was, as I said, that was 1988. And Charles now is, uh, He's still in California. He, he married uh, Cheryl Strassman from Yonkers, New York, and they have two daughters, Rachel, who is now 32, and Jessica, who is 30. Butch married Butch married Heidi Rhodes from Pittsburgh in 1992, and they had two children, Jason, who is now 17, and Haley, who is 13. And he, as I said before, I believe, works for uh, an advertising agency. He's a digital, technological webmaster, all oh, but that technical stuff that I'm not up on although I do have a computer and I email. But I do not Twitter or Facebook. I'll leave that to the younger ones. And uh, so they're both involved in their pursuing their careers. And, and, and Rachel also is in the film industry. She has a, a documentary, which I've got right in that drawer there, uh, which is called Without a Home, about homelessness in Los Angeles. She was in several film festivals and won some awards for that. And she's very busy pursuing that career in directing and producing and acting. and. And her sister Jessica is uh, into the musical aspect of the arts. She has, uh, is working on releasing an album called Lots of Love. So they're, and their mother too is, is a, uh, into design. Cheryl is a, a interior designer. And so on, on, uh, Charles's side, no, nobody went into anything business like their dad, all in the arts, painting or film or music. I don't think I ever was. In our day, that was not encouraged. I think my husband would love to have been in, in show business, show business. 
But as I said, when we, you know, in 19, when I graduated in 1940 and went off to do something, people weren't encouraged to go into uh, show business. That was not considered, it just, just wasn't encouraged. You had to be very, very passionate about wanting to do that in those days. Now, it looks like everybody's family has someone in that business. Somebody. I really think, oh, no matter who you meet, somebody's involved. Well, anyway, here I am now at 92, living. My husband passed away in two, we, we, back to I said we were in our house 51 years. Uh, we moved in 2004 to this building I'm in now, in 2004. And my husband passed away in 2005, at which time we had been married 56 years. But he's been gone eight years now, which just seems impossible. Doesn't seem that, seems like yesterday. But here I am, and my dear, dear friend Joanne Roos, all my dear friends from Newport News are still, the ones who are still with us are just still my dear friends. One thing out in my life, I've always kept up with everybody. Uh, I'm a people person and I love people and I just have kept them in my life whether they're in California or Tennessee or New York or Newport News or Texas. I have uh, a tremendous list of people with whom I still keep in contact with. And fortunately, along the way, I've made good friends with a lot of younger people because unfortunately, I've lost so many of my contemporaries. But my darling friend Joanne Roos, of course, is the one who initiated this session that I'm having with Soren, which I'm enjoying even though I'm getting tired. So, yeah, just to end up here, what would be one of the greatest achievements or things that are important in life after so many years, so many things that you You could ask me something like that. People, just your relationships with people to be, to have those things that were instilled in me that have seen me through. Let me think, I don't know. Yeah, what's, what do you think is important for people to do in life? I mean, because, you know, we work... Well, family, family. There's nothing like family. And to be, of course, honest. And... Give more than you get. Don't expect too much from people. And think, well, if they don't do that, I'm not going to do this. Give. Continue to give. I guess that's what I'd say. Does that make sense? Yeah. For me. Yeah. No. But, but I, I see so much of people who... Uh, pettiness, things that are unimportant to make too much of. Concentrate on your family, your loved ones, your friends, and what you can do to, to contribute to helping others. As I said, I've, I've just been very fortunate, and as I don't let people go. I hold on to them for dear life. Getting back to 
talking about family and how important it is, about the most important thing, actually. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my nieces and nephews. Starting, my older brother, Marx, had one son, one child, who's named Marx Jr., but he's always been called Mike. And he is my true stalwart. I depend on him for so much, and I love him dearly. I love all of them dearly. But he, he, he's such a big help to me. And his wife, Bonnie, of course, she is too. They have two children, Brian and Matthew. Brian is married to Jennifer, and they live in Atlanta with their son, Noah, who is five, and Isabella, who is going to be three next week. She was a preemie baby, weighing only a little over one pound when she was born, but she's just doing beautifully, and she is beautiful. And the other son, Matthew, the son of Mike, is married to Dana. Matthew was born on my birthday, and he was also married on my anniversary. So we have a very, very strong, special connection. And uh, both Brian and his family and Matthew and Dana live in Atlanta. That's from Marx, my older brother. My younger brother, Arthur Jr., had three children, David, who lives in Charlottesville with his wife, Karen, and they have two daughters, twin daughters, Sarah and Rebecca, both of whom are married now and living in Richmond. Then Arthur Jr. and his wife, Eleanor, had Janice, my niece, who lives in Tampa. And she, like me, is the middle child, the girl between two brothers. And her younger brother, the third child of my brother, Arthur Jr., is Rick who at one time was working in Washington and lived with us in our house. And he too is, they're all special, but he has this special connection having lived with us and being in the same kind of business, in the hotel business for a time that I was, which I didn't even mention about working for Marshall Coyne in, in the Madison Hotel. But, uh, Mike and David, Janice and Rick are my nephews and niece, and all of their children, the nieces and nephews, the greats and great-greats, are all very, very important and special to me. And uh, they're just a very important part of my life. And also, as we were talking about the things that you learn in life, I, that I didn't mention, that learning is so important. Never stop learning. Somebody said to me once, you never learn anything with your mouth open, meaning if you're doing a little bit of talking, you don't learn anything. So uh, I just wanted to add, add those. And also, if I can go back to when I was working for, for Marshall Cohen, who was the owner of the Madison Hotel and a very prominent builder and businessman and civic-minded man, philanthropic in the city of Washington, where I also had the opportunity to meet so many interesting people coming in and out the hotel. He also entertained a lot, with, which is what I helped him with. Uh, Frank Sinatra, and I, 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 the list goes on and on. I don't even want to mention them all, but they were just all lots of fun and interesting. And fortunately, I've been able to maintain connection with many of these folks. And uh, I guess 
Maybe that's it, Soren. Yeah. And I, uh, I hope I haven't left anybody out. Rachel and Jessica talked about them. Haley, I didn't say much about Jason and, and Haley. I did mention them. But anyway, you're not recording that. Thank you. Huh? <laughs> I'm just rambling on. <laughs> You'll put it all together, I know, some way. I don't want, I don't want, see, I, one of the things about, I don't ever want to hurt anybody. No, I don't think you. No, well, by leaving somebody out or, uh, and some, another quality I think that is so important is thoughtfulness. Very important to me. Anyway, that's, that's, this, this is your life, this was your life or something. Lots left out, my darling mother and father, oh my God. I didn't know my grandparents on my father's side. I briefly knew my mother's parents when I was very, very young. Oh my gosh, and I didn't mention my, my darling auntie, Brunette Kaufman, who was my father's sister, and her husband, Uncle Charlie, after whom my son Charles was named. But that's, that's, that's getting into, into too much trivia. Thank you so much. I feel like a, I don't know, I said I've been, been here so long, there's so much that's gone on in 90 years. How can you remember it all? Most of it I remember. Okay. Well, and there's things that happen, or somebody will say something, and then, oh my God, of course, remember that? because it doesn't, you don't think about those things all the time. But then the remembrances are wonderful.